Do you believe you found the skeleton? How would you tell the person? You first, first, first. How would you tell the Well, that's the question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. We were just told that because creationists don't understand the evolution of giraffes, that that somehow disproves evolution. Let's see what else we got. I have shared that on university campuses just full of atheists and evolutionists. And I've, I've said, okay, somebody tell me, how did that evolve? You know what their answer is? Given enough time, it'll happen. I said, well, what's the mechanism? First, what that probably means is he wasn't talking to students who are actually studying that field. College kids aren't just paragons of all the subjects one could possibly learn. They are themselves merely students and have focuses. But anyway, the mechanism is good old-fashioned natural selection and mutation. That's all that's needed. No endosymbiosis, no sexual selection, no neo-functionalization of horizontally transferred genetic material. Nothing fancy like that. Just mutations to developmental genes that are selected for. Over time, it'll show up. Okay. I mean, they don't have an answer because they don't have an answer. Right. God had to do it, just like he says. So while asking students about this, it seems that Dr. Martin never bothered to check on what professionals who actually study this said. Because if he had, he'd realize that there is in fact an answer. He doesn't have to accept it, but it exists. He spoke it into existence. And you think about that. Look what he spoke into existence. Animals that can live in the jungle... Animals that can live in the ice and snow, totally different diets, totally different feet even. Uh, so they can run like a polar bear. Different kind of feet. So it can run on the ice, doesn't slip. Polar bears grow hair on the bottom of their feet for a better grip on ice and insulation to avoid frostbite in their toes and feet. I'm not sure what about that is a problem for evolution, nor why animals adapting to very different habitats is a problem. That's kind of the whole point of evolution. Organisms adapting to their environment. Pointing out that the world is the way evolution would expect isn't really an argument against evolution. So in the winter, its hoof gets hard so that it can chip through the ice. Um, polar bears don't have hooves. What is happening right now? Does this man actually think that polar bears have hooves? In the summer, it gets soft so it can spread out and walk on top of the tundra so it doesn't sink in because the surface is going to thaw. I mean... God, God thought of every detail. The caribou, total different digestion in the winter than in the summer. Fun thing, biorhythms are controlled by both external cues and genetic factors, the latter of which are subject to natural selection. So I'm glad that Dr. Martin has scads of incredulity, but that means nothing in science. All right. In the same animal. Same animal. Um, no. And in the winter, it eats snow. In the summer, it drinks water out of a stream. What's the difference? Well, when it eats snow, it's not getting minerals. If it gets more minerals, that means it has to get rid of the minerals that it doesn't need, which means it has to get rid of excess water, which means it's getting rid not only of water, but heat. So by eating snow, it can keep the water. It doesn't make it have to go to the bathroom. So now it's keeping the heat. And then when it breathes out, it doesn't make steam because its turbinate bones are like a rolled up newspaper. So when it breathes out, these bones, they pull all the moisture back out so it's not losing moisture. Remember when this was all about differences in digestion and now we're just talking about water retention? Pepperidge Farm remembers. I mean, God thought of everything. I mean, jungle animals. Well, we're not going to go there. But I mean, the same thing. You're thinking. You're thinking, wow. This guy has no argument beyond cool animals exist. So before the flood, I think everything, everything was still eating plants. Yeah. Now, can lions eat plants? Can lions put plant matter in their mouths and swallow it? Yes. Can lions in the wild live as vegetarians? No. Their teeth can't effectively process plant matter. They have essentially no ability to digest cellulose. They have a severe taurine deficiency that really can't be made up for by eating uncooked plants and their digestive tract is too short to effectively digest plant matter. Well, of course they do. Well, your cat gets sick. What does it do? It goes out in the yard and eats grass, eats whatever it can find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in an effort to vomit, the plants are serving as an emetic, not as nutrition. 
This is like pointing out that sometimes humans have taken Ipecac, formerly used to induce vomiting in medical contexts, and then saying that therefore humans can live off the stuff exclusively. I promise, you'll starve if all you consume is Ipecac syrup. By the way, Ipecac was used to rapidly treat acute poisonings, but it is less effective than activated charcoal and itself presents a mild risk. Your dog, what's in World War II, we were sending all of our meat over to feed our soldiers in Africa and Europe and over that way. They fed the big cats in the zoos soybeans. Soybeans, like most beans, are highly toxic unless cooked, and that applies to cats as much as to humans. So pray tell, who was cooking soybeans for all the pre-flood kitties? This right here is exactly why I said that the cats can't get the nutrition they need from raw plants. Humans can use all sorts of thermal and chemical means to treat plant matter to make it easier to digest for a cat. So if it's getting that, then sure, it can get more nutrition from the plant matter. But I don't think that's really much of an option for wild cats. Unless we want to say that basically all modern hypercarnivores like cats and monitor lizards were all vegetarian pets of humans who depended on them entirely for their food. Indeed, while cats can survive for a while without meat, even specially prepared vegan food for cats in the modern world still does not provide enough nutrition, especially protein and taurine. That's why Christina M. Gray et al. recommended against vegan diets in their paper Nutritional Adequacy of Two Vegan Diets for Cats, published in the American Veterinary and Medical Association on December 1, 2004. And that's just the first of many papers reporting on the inadequacy of vegan and vegetarian diets for cats. Will a lion die if it just eats cooked soy and rice or something for a year or two? Probably not. But it will be malnourished and far from thriving. It will, in fact, be on its way to the player select screen. They thrived, okay? No, not okay. I can't find any documentation at all saying this. All I can find is research that says that this idea is laughable that lions could survive off plants. The whole thing just comes down to, guys, lions could eat plants before the flood as evidenced by the fact that they can absorb plant proteins from cooked plants. And all lions would have to do is harvest beans, find a way to build a fire, find a way to make pottery, then boil the beans and also survive without taurine. Yeah, that's super plausible, guys. Just because an animal has big teeth doesn't mean it has to eat meat. And no one judges animal diet by the size of the teeth. It's based on the shape of the teeth. Flat teeth mash up leaves. Cusped teeth take on harder things like seeds and nuts. Shearing teeth tear through flesh. And while a layperson might look at the big canines of a camel and think it's a meat eater, an actual anatomist will look at their grinding and crushing molars and chomping, not piercing incisors, and correctly conclude that it's a vegetarian. At least most of the time. Just about anything will take a bit of meat if given a chance and a low risk. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Sherwin, do you have uh, any other examples? Uh, maybe from your invertebrate line of thought? Yeah, no. I'd like to hear that. <laughs> let's, let's talk about something a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm trying to think uh, some of the invertebrate creatures, uh, mostly what we find, for example, in tidal pools. So like crabs, snails, mussels, barnacles, clams, limpets, and sea stars, and sea urchins. At least those are the invertebrates I'm used to finding in tide pools. And uh, there's lots and lots of invertebrates there. As a matter of fact, 95% of all fossils are marine invertebrates, which are like clams. Oh, forgive me. I guess for no reason we're switching to fossil marine invertebrates. We've been doing all extant organisms so far, but sure, why not? Let's talk about marine clams or something. Also, I'm willing to bet that Frank Sherwin couldn't tell the difference between a clam and a brachiopod. But I think w some of the more fascinating marine invertebrates, invertebrates, of course, is the octopus. Okay, well, I guess that was just a completely irrelevant thing about fossils that had nothing to do with anything. But sure, let's talk about the octopus. I do like them. In fact, if you like them too, I suggest reading the book Children of Ruin, which has a bunch of them in it. Although you may want to read Children of Time first, both are by Adrian Tchaikovsky and both explore the evolution of sapiens in organisms vastly different to humans and how that affects their developing societies and also how humans might interact with them. The first book also explores ideas like how deep time might be experienced in a single human lifetime with things like Einsteinian time dilation and suspended animation technology as well as transhumanism. And the octopus is absolutely incredible from from the get-go. It, it is so bizarre and so strange because it's one of the few, very few animals that can alter its RNA, its ribonucleic acid. I was going to ask him for a citation, but I found it, so I won't bother. 
This is from RNA editing underlies temperature adaptation in K plus channels for polar octopuses. Note that K plus means potassium ions. And yes, it is true that polar octopus species do edit their RNA to allow certain functions at extremely cold temperatures that would otherwise be too slow to function. Uh, they haven't been able to see that in any other kind of animal. Oh, so no argument then. Okay, what's the next true thing that Sherman can say that in no way will he argue is a problem for evolution, but we'll just assume his audience will think is a problem because he's primed them to think that neat means no evolution. It also has eyes very much like our eyes, like a vertebrate's eyes, but of course the octopus is an invertebrate. Which is why it has structural differences, like a blood supply that is proximal to the retina rather than distal as it is in vertebrate eyes, which results in them lacking the blind spot common to vertebrate eyes. It's almost like these distantly related organisms had similar selection pressures throughout their history, but since they independently evolved these superficially similar eyes, there are actually deep structural differences between them. And so the problem with that is, from an evolutionary standpoint, trying to explain how you could have the octopus eye that looks so much like a vertebrate or a human eye. It's not a mystery at all. It's precisely what we should expect. Superficially similar organs doing the same function that are significantly different when you look at the underlying anatomy. But also at the same time, there are structures on the surface of the skin of the octopus called chromatophores. These chromatophores are, are microscopic, but they are nonetheless absolutely amazing in the fact that it can secrete into the skin, the chromatophore, uh, pigments. And the pigment change can be affected within a split second. And we've seen videos, and you can go on YouTube and see how an octop octopus can swim up to an outcrop of rock and immediately take on the shape and also the color of that uh, rock output just within a fraction of a second. Well, chromatophores expand and contract. They don't excrete the pigment out into the skin. That would make color changes far too slow. But yeah, chromatophores are cool. But again, cool doesn't mean problem for evolution. Well, that means the octopus has to have a special neuroregulatory system from its brains, and it has multiple brains. Kind of? So the octopus has a central brain and a ring of nerves around the mouth about where the arms grow from. And then each arm has its own large nerve cord. Now, similar to how many reflex actions in humans don't need to be processed by the brain, for example, if you touch something very hot, your hand will pull away before you even really process the pain. That's because once the signal gets to your spine, it's the spine that sends a reflex action impulse to your arm. Similarly, the arms of an octopus are at least partially controlled directly by the nerves running down to the arms. So while they are semi-independent, it's not really fair to say that an octopus has more than one brain. It doesn't at least not more than you do by having a spine that can send signals to the limbs independent of the brain. Uh, going down to these uh, chromatophores affecting the change within a split second. In fact, no, the chromatophores are controlled by the central brain, not the nerves in the arms. And this is true in cuttlefish as well. In fact, the control neurons for them are mapped onto the brain in a way that it spatially correlates to where they are on the body. So the cascades of neural activity in the brain can correlate with waves of color activity, which is pretty cool. In fact, I'd argue that's cooler than what Sherwin is telling us. Uh, it has uh, suckers, and the suckers have detectors, receptors on it that it can taste with the suckers. This just in, the primary anatomy for food acquisition in an animal has chemoreceptive capabilities. Next up, we learn if you really do get wet when jumping into water. And uh, octopus has eight arms, but it uses two. It, it, it uses two more than the other six. Handedness, the evolutionist nightmare. Honestly, why is he even saying this? He's certainly not making a point. Uh, I remember a story that shows an octopus, dare I say it, might have something like a sense of humor. He then just tells a story about an octopus that rejected a piece of rotten shrimp by jamming it into the filter intake. Then a story about sneaky octopuses getting out of their tanks and messing with the tank fixtures and eating animals in other tanks. There is no point to these stories, and they're long, just like his whole presentation. Yeah, definitely some design there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, octopus has always been octopus because... Because he doesn't know about Proteroctopus ribetti, an actual proto-octopus, hence the name, from the lower Caledonian stage of the Middle Jurassic. It is basal to both Octopoda and Vampiropoda. So it looks like we do have transitional fossils showing the evolution of modern cephalopods. Weird, that. Uh, an octopus it has no inter internal skeleton or anything. One no, they have no bones. They do have a skeleton. It just happens to be hydrostatic. So it uses the essentially incompressible nature of water to transmit force and keep parts of the body rigid. That's not no skeleton. 
It's just not a skeleton like a human or even an insect has. Evolution is said to have an octopus fossil is like, a, like finding a fossil of a sneeze because it's just a kind of a gelatinous type thing. But they have found very clear impressions of octopus in the fossil record. True, including transitional ones. Which leads one to believe, well, let's see now, it had to be buried suddenly. It's false. And catastrophically. No way. Uh, no time frame at all. Pure fiction because it's, it's all made of a gelatinous ooze. So we're talking about a very catastrophic burial, kind of like you would get with a, um, uh, a flood. And maybe a flood could do something <laughs> yeah. like that. False. So let's look at where Proteroctopus was found. I'll bet it's basically the opposite of a flood deposit. Oh, look, I just checked, and it was found in the La Volt Lagerstadt in France, which is, and I quote here from Chabonnier et al., a low energy and deep water depositional environment. Si vous préférez, la papier a dit un milieu de dépôt comme sous une tranche de importante. Who could have ever guessed that he'd be exactly wrong about the kind of depositional environment that results in excellent fossils of invertebrates without hard parts? I am shocked. Shocked. Well, not that shocked. And uh, not only that, but giraffes have always been giraffes. Ah, yes. I forgot that animals like Cebatherium giganteum, Giraffocarex punjabiensis, and Brahmatherium megacephalum just never existed. Those fossils were planted there by Satan to trick you. If your elitist East Coast evolution is real, why has no one found the missing link between modern humans and ancient apes? We did find it. It's called Homo erectus. Then you have proven my case, sir. For no one has found the link between apes and this Homo erectus. Yes, they have. It's called Homo habilis. Aha! Uh -huh. But no one has found the missing link between ape and the so-called Homo habilis. Yes, they have. It's called Australopithecus africanus. Oh, ho, I've got you now. Fair enough. But where, then, is the missing link between apes and this Darwinius massili? Answer me that, Professor. Oh. Okay, granted that one missing link is still missing, but just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Pshaw! Things don't exist simply because you believe in them. Thus saith the almighty creature in the sky! Whales have always been whales and- Ah yes, because the protocedids with their more than 20 distinct genera are also just tricks from Satan to test your faith in Jesus. And just on down the list it goes. As a matter of fact, one other thing about the whale is whales, of course, are marine mammals. What does it even mean to be a mammal if evolution is false? It's not like mammals share common ancestry, according to these guys. Why should mammal even be a category? And um, whales don't get cancer, and that's kind of a, a strange situation. So there's a lot of research to be done there. This is just not true. Whales do get cancer, but they get it at a surprisingly low rate. And the research has been done they have extra tumor suppressor genes. Almost like as they grew large, having extra tumor suppressor genes was a selective advantage or something. And also, almost like we've observed gene duplications in real time. So that's not exactly a mystery. But whales, as they dive down, they have to expel all the air so they don't get nitrogen narcosis, the bends. And whales have a very, very dark skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscle of the uh, mammalian uh, oceanic mammals is almost black. I mean, whale meat can be dark, as in this picture of whale meat in Japan, but it can also be quite pale, as in this picture of whale meat also in Japan. Japan being one of the only countries that still engages in commercial whaling. I'm not sure where we're going with this. And that's due to a special protein called myoglobin, which is a, a hemoglobin type of a, uh, a type of a molecule, but is found encased in the muscle. I mean, it's distantly related to hemoglobin. I'm not sure I'd call it a hemoglobin type protein. They do have similar functions, though. And so we, we have hemoglobin in our blood. As do whales and all vertebrates. But also, virtually all mammals and most vertebrates make myoglobin in their muscle. You ever see that clearish red stuff at the bottom of packaged meat? That's not blood. That's myoglobin seeping out. So as the whale dives down, it ex exhales, it ex exhales the air, and it can go down many, many feet. And the uh, everything shuts down except to the heart and the brain. So the heart still is beating, and it's beating, uh, putting up the blood to the brain to keep it alive. Everything else is shut down. How could the whale swim if its muscles are shut down? Maybe it doesn't shut everything down, because of course it doesn't. That would be fatal. How come the tissue doesn't die? Goes back to that myoglobin. That myoglobin is packed, 
packed with oxygen. So the whale can stay down, down there for a long time, extracting oxygen from the myoglobin, which is packed in the muscle, and then come back up. So it's just amazing, amazing design features. I'm not sure why making more myoglobin than most mammals do is a problem for evolution. I keep saying it, but myoglobin production is controlled by genes, and those genes are subject to modification by mutation, including to upregulate and produce more myoglobin, which, if beneficial, can be selected for. And I'm going out on a limb and saying that deep diving whales are benefited by longer stay times and deeper dive depths under the water. After this, one of the hosts goes on about faith or something. I don't care, so I'm cutting it. I can tell you what one of the biggest hang-ups is, is those days in Genesis. And people just can't, uh, that was a struggle I had. They just can't get by the billions of years. Yeah, I bet that being demonstrably wrong about how old the Earth is by a factor of more than 757,000 is a bit of a hang-up. That's about the same error as saying that the distance to the moon is half a kilometer. Even flat earthers aren't that wrong about the distance to the moon. Or saying that the Empire State Building reaches almost 90% of the way to the actual moon. Or saying that Usain Bolt ran 100 meters in only 12.7 microseconds. I can't imagine why being that wrong might make people not take you seriously. Because they're, we basically are taught billions of years will solve all the problems. Just give it enough time, and, and we get stuck on that. I mean, there are also actually tens of thousands of studies all supporting it, independent of what would be convenient for evolution. I don't care, and neither should anyone else. But you can't get billions of years out of the Bible. If your interpretation of the Bible is contradicted by reality, then either ditch the Bible or change your interpretation. After this, it's a long diatribe about how to properly interpret Genesis. I super don't care about that. Interpret it however you want. But what I like to tell people who are being raised in a theistic evolutionist environment in a college or a university. I just appreciate the rare acknowledgement that theists who accept evolution for the fact that it is, actually exist. Even if he disagrees with them. I, I like to share with them that there are natural limits to biological change. Amen. And that we can do, uh, you know, we can change, uh, get thousands of different varieties of roses, but they're all roses. Yes, that's how evolution works. Once a group splits off and is isolated from a sister group, those two groups can now go on to diversify, but their descendants will remain part of that bigger group. For example, in becoming primates, the ancestors of humans didn't stop being mammals. And in becoming monkeys, they didn't stop being primates. And in becoming apes, they didn't stop being monkeys. And in becoming humans, they didn't stop being apes. But if you go for another group, the ancestors of foxes didn't stop being mammals when they became carnivorans, nor did they stop being carnivorans when they became caniforms, nor did they stop being caniforms when they became canids, nor did they stop being canids when they became foxes. If you have a rose, all of his descendants will be roses, because that's the law of monophyly. You can't outgrow your ancestry. If you have children, how many generations will have to go by before their descendants are no longer your descendants? There is no number, because all of them, for as long as they persist, will be your descendants. So there's a lot of what we call horizontal variation. Uh, same thing with dogs and, and all that. But we don't find that real vertical macro evolution. I challenge him to look at the literature, to ask the professors, give me compelling evidence for real vertical evolution. Okay. Here you go. Otherwise, all the examples, the class I took in evolution in Colorado was all just a, a, a genetics class where we looked at the natural biological uh, changes, but they were limited changes that, that occurred. Limited by what? In what way? 
I mean, in principle, any given change to a genome is at least possible, from whole genome duplication all the way down to single nucleotide point mutations. What limits this? He won't say. It's just a catchphrase. There is no mechanism limiting the population genetics of organisms to certain boundaries. At least, none that has ever been proposed, let alone confirmed experimentally or observationally. Then he goes on with yet more Bible stuff. I don't care. But then it's finally, mercifully, over. This video was physically painful to watch and respond to. I literally got more than one cluster headache just writing this script. I'm actually currently fighting through a cluster headache just to finish it off. Well, I hope I took all the pain so that you don't have to. I also hope you learned something about the truly remarkable animals that just happened to pose no particular challenge to the theory of evolution. If you liked this video, hit the like button. If you didn't, tell me why not in the comments and hit the dislike button. Either way, please do subscribe and hit the bell icon and turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Benthoven, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Lend and Noel, Mabdi Babdi, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Atheist Animal. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting, so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.